The offseason is in its young stage as the Mets have made a few internal transactions so far. They've picked up team options for Carlos Carrasco, Daniel Vogelbach, and John Curtis. They've claimed Taylor Saucedo off of waivers from Toronto. And of course, the big one, extending Edwin Diaz to a five-year, $102 million contract to make him the highest paid reliever in history. But there is still plenty of work to do this offseason, and we have eight major areas the Mets have to address to to turn this team into a World Series contender. Here's our official checklist for the 2023 Mets offseason. So there's tons of ways that the Mets can address these areas, but hopefully that the Mets build a deep enough roster to become a World Series contender. So we did this video at the trade deadline saying, hey, we need this, 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 and this, and the Mets checked off one and a half. So there's a ton of pending free agents in the pitching rotation. They still need a couple of bats in the lineup. So again, let's see if they can fill the checklist or leave it blank just like I did most of my tests. There are a lot of openings with all the pending free agents the Mets have, but it's not only, okay, let's fix our whole and complete the team but what about what happens after i mean what about the depth what about the backup and the backup to your backup i mean you don't want situations where your backup in is luis guillorme he gets hurt one of your starting infielders gets hurt and you have devin Morrow starting a big game against the atlanta braves like these are things that actually happen to the mets we saw a handful of pitchers that nobody had ever heard of that had pitched in major leagues in years and they were making meaningful outings for the mets so it's not just complete a bullpen which has a ton of holes it's not just complete the rotation where there's a ton of holes but it's also having guys after that that still are capable major league players i just hope that they use this financial flexibility to actually create a full-on 40-man roster of guys that you can actually rely on so let's get to this checklist at the top of the list we have adding a frontline starting pitcher Jacob deGrom is going to be going to free agency, and there aren't really that many borderline aces on the market. Whether it is bringing back Jacob deGrom, going after a guy like Justin Verlander, or Carlos Rodon, there's definitely some support that they need to add the top of the rotation with Max Scherzer, the only official, legitimate starter at the top. I think of the obvious guys, it's just bring back Jacob deGrom, it's pretty easy spend the money but you're also going to the risk of hey do you want to pay a 35 year old four years at the 44 million dollars and be attached to the hip to two aging pitchers who have not been the most durable the last couple of years of about 90 million dollars your external options are carlos rodon even though he's had two consecutive very great season. He does have a past of being not the healthiest player, but maybe the Brewers were to trade one of Woodruff and Burns. Then again, you're going to have to move God's sum of prospects that, again, we've continued to hammer home. You really don't have. You're going to have to give up top end, high end you know, prospects, even maybe in some of the depth in our rotation of Peterson and McGill. To be a top flight guy, you want to pair with Scherzer because when you go into a series in the playoffs, which this team does have the aspirations of distantly making the playoffs, you're playing three to five to seven game series. When you have two top flight aces you can depend on, it can shorten a series. I think the easiest one is for DeGrom, but maybe the wiser move is Rodon. You know, it's so easy to just say, okay, who's the best player? Let's sign them. But there's so much more that goes into it. And but a guy like Jacob DeGrom at his age, it's all about projecting. It's all about looking forward to the future. We know DeGrom has had great success in New York as a Met, winning back-to-back -back Cy Youngs. But the big thing is health so you could pay him he could be really good for you but if you only get half a season out of him maybe two quarters of a season out of him it just becomes very tough to really make the most of that value where that money could be spent elsewhere verlander on a one-year deal could be great but again we're talking about okay well next year we're in the same exact scenario oh, we need another big time starting pitcher so as much as i would love verlander like andrew said rodan's not a bad option you can look at the trade market the other thing it comes down to is just how much do the mets want to spend you break him in $100 million to reliever. Do you want to go this much to one starting pitcher when you still need like three or four and you need all that bullpen? I just think it all comes down to, you know, do the Mets take that quantity over quality approach? In the past, we've seen them take the quality approach. We've seen it hurt them, 
So I'm, I'm really curious to see how they go about this. Year. I personally believe that Jacob deGrom is your best option here, mainly because he pretty much checks every single box of what they need to do. It may cost a little bit more than anybody else because he is the best pitcher in baseball. We've seen a lot of injuries recently from him, and that's something that has really been the main concern. I just don't know how any of these other frontline or so-called frontline pieces are going to do in New York. And that is something that really weighs me down with how a lot of external options come in here and they're not the same player in a New York market. And even though we know they have the talent, it takes a toll on a lot of these players. There's no guarantee that DeGrom will stay healthy, but I think this is a risk that I would be willing to take because he's Jacob DeGrom. It becomes one of those exceptions as to we know this guy is the best in the game when he's healthy. We know that he will continue to be the best in the game when he's 100% healthy. I like a top-heavy rotation, but I need them to finish the rotation. And that brings us to the next part of the checklist, which is multiple durable back and arms. The Chris Bassett's of the world, Nathan Avaldi's of the world, multiple guys that can step up and be your emergency number two, your emergency number one power possibly if you're in deep hell with your rotation. If the Mets do intend on keeping Jacob DeGrom, this is actually one of the most important parts of the checklist because when those guys had their injuries, DeGrom and Scherzer, Bassett doing a really good job of stepping up in each outing, going over 100 pitches, over 110 pitches, giving you six innings, seven innings, eight innings, which really in the long, you know, grand scheme, 162 makes a big deal. You're saving your relievers for when the times where Carrasco gives you five innings, you haven't rested enough bullpen because of the adding... Chris Bassett gave. I mean, you can look at a Martin Perez. You can look at a guy like Tyler Anderson. I mean, I mean, these are other arms that Mets have to consider because it's not going to be a top flight guy. But since you know you have Scherzer, you're looking for that middle rotation three guy. And if they don't want to keep Chris Bassett, even though Chris Bassett had a really good year for the Mets, he didn't necessarily finish it really strong. So this is something that if the Mets do want to look at another arm, if they do intend on keeping DeGrom and they already kept Carrasco, this would be a good time to maybe explore some other options. The Mets have lost in back-to-back -back off seasons. You know, Marcus Stroman was the innings eater of that rotation. You lost him. Chris Bassett, pending UFA, maybe he's brought back. It's going to give you 190 plus innings every year. Are you willing to lose that back-to-back -back years to go out just 200 innings from a guy, especially how fragile the position of starting pitcher is? He said Nathan Evaldi already has a multi-year off for the Red Sox. Actually, in the trade market, you could see a Pablo Lopez or... Marco Gonzalez, guys like Kelly and Chris Flexen, a former Met. Maybe if it's not the greatest stuff or ability, just give me any. The other two guys that the Mets have, you know, on the roster are actually signed. McGill and Lucchese. Both guys had really injury-plate years last year, so it's not even so much the old guys. Oh, they're susceptible to injury. Even our younger pieces have had some injuries. So durable, you know, even if they are an older guy, as long as they're durable, that's what we really need in the middle of this particular rotation. Age is usually just one of the main factors. Injuries can go throughout an entire pitching rotation, whether you're young or you're not. It's a risk that you take with everyone. Now, as for all the options for the back end of the rotation, because you're going to have to use a lot of quantity looking at some quality guys at the same time. What would you guys put at the top of your list? Two of these guys to put at your back end of the rotation. Let's say the Mets bring back DeGrom and Bassett. They have their one, two, three. Two guys that you want to bring in. My number one is Nathan Abel. Consistently be the number four, give you the innings. Sometimes the lead, sometimes it's you want to rip your head off, but consistently he gives me the inning. And then I kind of want to add a, a southpaw in this rotation. And I'm going to go Sean Mania. Again, he did have a rough year, but he's had better years. i will be a lefty in this rotation, so it's not goddamn David Peterson. Better hair, better dude. You know, for me, it's a Valdi and Manai to finish the those four and five. I'm also a massive fan of Nathan Valdi. I've loved him for a long time, and he's a guy that has that postseason experience with Boston and the Red Sox. So I would love to add him, but like a lefty. So I'll take any of the batch, whether it's Manaya, Quintana, Perez, Anderson, like you said, Degrom, Scherzer, Bassett. Ivaldi and any of those lefties, that's that's definitely a good start. And it doesn't stop there because you still want to, okay, if any of those guys do have injuries because they are older, Carrasco, I'm looking at you, you need one to two, maybe even three guys that could step in competent enough, give you those five innings, keep it close, and then you, you see what happens from there. But that's just starting with the rotation. There's still more work to be done. As for me, I think Nathan Ivaldi is at the top of the list because I think he's a very durable arm. But he makes starts. He's very durable, and he pushes through. But I also would love to add a little bit of Martin Perez because he throws the kitchen sink. He may have had a little bit of success towards the end free agent year, which may be a little bit scary. Hopefully, the Mets can also include some other guys. And that brings us to versatile bullpen depth. Trevor Williams, this is the category he would fall in. 
guys that can come into the rotation, guys that can be in the bullpen, come into any single situation and possibly shove through it. We talked about Matt Boyd before, Danny Duffy, who was injured recently, maybe some older guys as well. Ross Stripling was one of them. Wade Miley was one of them. Jimmy Nelson also comes to mind. Some guys that you can put into the back end if you have some injuries. I think you can make this position internally with David Peterson and Tyler McGill could fill this role, including a Joey Lucchese as well. Ring the bell for Danny Duffy. It seems like for four years now, I've been a big fan of Danny Duffy. Since obviously you could just bring back Trevor Williams in this role, and I think he would like to come back. I think the Mets would, he would be valuable to come back to the team. So with this role, I would either bring Trevor Williams back or stick internally. So I would be looking more in the starting pitcher category. I, I want a traditional long lever for, you know, the rare that let's say a pitcher is feeling something weird in, in the arm or wherever, or they're dehydrated. I have to leave in the second inning. It's just a one-time thing, but it's not a bad thing to have a Joe Ross, a Michael Lorenz, and just these guys that have some starting experience in the rain delays or, or you know, or the double headers, like just having these other guys that have starting pitching experience that are in your bullpen and could make the start and not totally tax your bullpen. It's better than some of the other crap that we saw make stars for the Mets this year. Speaking of internally, I, I hope that they can finally put Josh Walker in one of these roles. He's also had some injury history. I hope they can solve this internally of guys who can go in and out of the rotation, but we've seen a lot of guys come in, the Chris Flexons of the world and the Corey Oswalt's of the world and the Walker Lockett's of the world who were like, okay, well, they can come out of the bullpen, they can start, and they're not good. So if you can get some quality off of the free agent market of guys whose stock is up, that would be nice of extra guys to back up. Up a more older rotation that we're looks like we're going with so far with the only guys in our rotation being Max Scherzer who's 38 Carlos Carrasco who is just showing his age and at this point to what I've been seeing he's been pitching like he's 45 so as for versatility guys that can come in in every situation there's one situation that rises above the rest when you need clutchness a high leverage right-handed reliever there aren't Many that are high regarded, but there are definitely some guys who have the experience. Guys like David Robertson out there. You have Craig Stammen out there. I think that Brad Boxberger would be a great high leverage reliever, the type of stuff that he has. How should the Mets get this bridge to Edwin Diaz? When we talk about high leverage, we talk about a lot of different situations. I think Chris Martin still makes a lot of sense. Does not walk batters, and he's a big time ground ball guy. So you bring him in second and first, one out, he gets that big double play you're at the end it's not going to cost you much he's up there in age but chris martin was never good because of how hard he threw how much spin rate he had it's just because he's a quality pitcher that knows how to pitch we we sure we can get a relief on a goddamn one year deal this year jesus christ thanks thanks steve two of the better options are already off the board and suarez and rafael montero inking five years and three years what the hell are we doing here gms you look at guys like david robertson potentially being the eighth inning guy but again looking at a veteran at this point do you ch maybe try to get out of you know on another one-year deal. I trust him more than Lugo or May or Given. Those are the kind of guys that are left unless you're making a trade externally, which you really want to give up top prospect for any type of high-end guy. Again, the market for relievers is very weird. Now you're looking at a bunch of vets or a bunch of guys who had bad years that maybe can you find another diamond in the rough, which the Mets have done pretty well with lately, but just to find that new bridge. I am really hoping that they go after Corey Kniebel. This will continue to be one of my pushes throughout the entire offseason. The Phillies tried to ruin him with his pitch selection. He is a man who relies on breaking stuff and they made him prioritize high leverage velocity and it completely destroyed his arm. And I really hope with someone who does very well with sinker ballers and breaking ball pitchers such as Jeremy Hefner, that they bring him in as a possibility. We're going to have to see when he comes back from injury. We don't know if he's going to be healthy, but he's definitely one of those guys I would love to take a bet on. He's young or a reliever. And as for all of these pitchers that I've seen them add, I need them to aim younger. And I've talked about this way too many times of guys who have had success but they still have a lot of success left. Maybe uh, one of their White Sox expensive relievers? In a trade? That's a possibility. I mean, there is some trades that you can put on the market right now. I mean, Andrew, I mean, look what the Braves like... did with Iglesias. Like, like Andrew talks about that Hendricks mm -hmm. thing. Like, the Braves literally said, oh, we'll just take Iglesias' contract, and you guys don't need much back in return. Like, if the Mets have the money, they theoretically could do that for Liam Hendricks. Matt Allen, maybe. 
couple sweeteners. I think this is going to definitely fill the Adovino role. I don't see any possibility of him repeating what he did in his 36-year-old season. It has Justin Wilson and Aaron Loop written all over it. They had yeah. amazing years, but they got overworked, and they're just not the same pitcher next year. It, it just it has all the signs. So, I mean, we, we've seen it happen back-to-back -back years. I don't want to see it happen again. I don't want to live in fear of doing that, of, of not taking that type of risk, but I'm not going to go after a 37-year-old pitcher, especially for a multi-year contract. That's just not going to happen. I also don't want to have two long-term contracts in that bullpen, especially when one of them is the highest paid reliever in history. Now, high leverage righties are important, but also lefty high leverage relievers are important. I think we all know the one man that is at the top of our list in free agency, Andrew Chafin. Out of the three of us, I don't think there's really that much disagreement. It might be an overpay, mainly because of what we're seeing on the reliever market, but they need a lefty, a durable lefty that's not project or absolutely terrible. He should have been signed last year, but we found out why they didn't go out and get him last year because obviously he was not vaccinated and the Mets were kind of fearful. Now there's no excuse. They desperately need this guy. He's the top guy on the market. Taylor Rogers, maybe on a bounce back, he would be decent if we're talking trades. Aaron Bummer's probably ahead of him, in my opinion. A little bit younger. Great mustache, great name. There's no, there's no better combination of having another high level lefty and maybe he's the setup man to get to Diaz in the eighth inning. I like Taylor Rogers. I, I've talked about him a lot. I always value the guys that have closing experience especially like I said before if the Mets want to do that thing where they have Edwin Diaz come in the eighth inning need somebody that can come in the ninth I think Rodgers could be one of those guys. And then the other guy that I think if you get really cheap I'll take a flyer Will Smith. He had the bad year last year but in his career He's been a good reliever, also has closing experience. I, I think if you get one year, only a few million of these other lefties, the lefties that have had on their team, I'll take a flyer. There is another but guy no. out there that flies under the radar. Had a pretty tough year because he was kind of injured. Jose Alvarez, last six years of his career before that, I mean, he's been a very quality reliever. Middle relief, one of those high leverage guys, not bad. Again, a sinker baller. It matches up pretty well with Jeremy Hefner. So it's just another name that you can put out there. I'm going to ask Andrew because of how the market is set with relievers. How much do you think Andrew Chafin is going to cost? He opt out of a $6.5 million option. So that's the benchmark. He wants that probably at minimum over multiple years, especially him being the top flight lefty. I wouldn't be shocked if this is another Trevor May type deal. Seven, eight, maybe nine million over, 19 million over two years. You might have to go to a third year or make that third year an option. I would expect anywhere from eight million or more over at minimum two years. We know that an overpay is coming, and I think the backup plan is if they don't want to overpay Chafin. If he's asking for too much given the market, Taylor Rodgers might be the next guy because he's coming off a relatively tough year but still put out quality. I don't know. This is going to be very interesting. They just ignore the lefties completely. Bring Which in is a, a thing. I mean, Houston won the World Series doing it, just having a bunch of right hairs that throw gas. So Standing, Montero, Nariz, Presley, like, it can work. I mean, ideally, like, we have this idea that you want some lefties in there, but just get good pitchers. Let's get to offense. We know what the main problem was. Power protection for Alonzo. And then the problem was versatile power protection around Alonzo. We brought in Daniel Vogelbach, Darren Ruff, two guys that can't really play a position. Darren Ruff was pretty much hanging by his shoelaces in the outfield. So guys who can actually play a position and also could be power protection, be a DH one guy that we know out there that we like, Jock Peterson, we've talked about him before. There's other guys out there. Anthony Rizzo is someone I would love to consider. I kind of want to stay away from that because I think he might get a little bit overpaid. We also can go on the older side with the Evan Longoria's of the world. That we, Mitch Hanniger was another one we've talked about before. Uh, such a huge topic that we talked about for 162 games and is still a problem. Especially with the, when the fence is in, I'm looking more lefty bats now, especially. Josh Bell for the right price. Again, me Maybe even Brandon Green against lefties, you know, a guy can play everything to give you some stability as well, hit left-handed pitching. You know, those are a few options, Trey Mancini as well, but I'm on the Hunter Renfro train. I think he fits very perfectly for this team, but, you know, moving Mark Canna out of the outfield, but, but he's more of a left fielder, but maybe make Canna the DH. If Renfro is brought in and play left field or right field, move Marte back to left. That's kind of, I guess, my dream scenario is Renfro or, or Jock. Hell, why not both? Because that would be adding like 60 homers just compared to two. 
I got a guy. I've always loved him. I don't care if the fit's perfect. Wilson Contreras. His bat, he still fits what the Mets lineup needs. Contreras, his whole career, has absolutely destroyed lefties. They said there was still discussions on who the starting catcher is going to be. End the discussions. You could have Contreras start. Alvarez could be ready whenever the heck he wants. If it's this year, great. If it's next year, that works too. And you could even platoon them. Every, sometimes Alvarez catches. Sometimes Contreras catches. But this guy in the lineup every single day, he even could play left field a little bit. Like, he's a really good athlete for the catcher position. So I think he still makes a ton of sense. If these other guys get overpaid, your Josh Bells of the world, all these other guys that we talked about. I love Judge. You know, I love those guys. But – I think that Contreras is just a really balanced bat. I wouldn't sleep on him. I wouldn't just totally just throw out the possibility altogether. And also, we talk about the J.D. Martinez of the world, these other guys. Contreras is younger than So I think even though he's a catcher, he still is younger than some of these other options that are available. But, you know, Frank wants to put $160 million into our catching situation at this point. <laughs> McCann, Alvarez. Joey Gallo, yes or no? I would rather have Frank and his crippling and anxiety-filled hands take an A.B. than Joey Gallo take another A.B. in a New York uniform. He was a failure in New York. I think it all just determines what they're going to be doing with Daniel Vogelbach because they did bring him back. We don't know if he's going to be coming off the bench or he's going to be an everyday starter. Hopefully he is coming off the bench and they definitely aim for a lot more versatility in free agency. I'm hoping that Darren Ruff is not back. Fingers are crossed. Hopefully they determine what they're going to do with Mark Vientos. Hopefully... It's one. I'm hoping it's two. Like we said, Jock Peterson trading for Renfro. I'd love that. They had the deadline for the Carrasco team option. Was there a deadline for Ruff as well? Was it the same deadline? Was there no deadline? Like, what's the deal with his team option? Ruff is guaranteed, has a guaranteed contract. The option is after next season. We don't want a rental, but you know what? Don't want a rental, right? You got him for a minute. Multiple years, but he's old as hell. So, I mean, like, he only gets worse with time. Like, they're just, their thought process is Mind-boggling. Fire Epler. Starting caliber outfielder. Whether it's bringing back Brandon Nimmo, whether it's exploring those external options and moving Starling Marte to center, which I don't like, I think we all can agree that Brandon Nimmo is the best case scenario. Correct? I think in every situation, you're going to be giving up things that you do not want to be giving up. The only thing that stops you in this position is money. And we all know that our owner has a lot of it. So paying Brandon Nimmo will be the best situation for this. A guy like Ian Happ, you're going to have to give up assets, with which we know they don't want to do because Mark Vientos is so precious and Ronnie Mauricio is so precious and there are going to be God's children. I know that there's a big name out there, but people, it's not going to happen. I, I think there's two scenarios the Mets could go in. They could either go offense and move Marte to center and grab one of these big cornerbacks, or they could go defense at first, which is a thing. I mean, there's plenty of contenders that have a weak hitting center field that's just defensive first. So we know those guys, the Jackie Bradleys of the world, the Kevin Kiermaier's of the world. It's like, we know those guys exist, but if they did want to go offense, I mean, you could technically sign Andrew Benintendi, who does have a similar skill set to Brandon Nimmo. Maybe put Benny in center, but you could slide Canna or Marte over. We talked about Mitch before as DH bat, but he also could play right field. And again, you can move one of those guys to center field. They could get a Jerkson Profar. He had a really nice year with San Diego. Kicked our butt in the playoffs. You get him, you move one of those guys over to center. So it really comes down to if they don't get Nimmo, because Nimmo's the guy that has the best combination. Play center field very well. But these other guys, you would kind of have to choose. You want to go offense or you want to go defense? You could go defense with center field because Nimmo's here because of how valuable of a bat he is and how he's the ideal leadoff hitter. Well, we have a lot of leadoff hitters on this roster, so you could replace him and go defense in center field. If they do that, McCann can't be starting and they can't have the platoon crap at D8. It does make me nervous going defensive center field first because that reminds me way too much of Kevin Pillar and that really scares me. I hope they don't go defense in center field. I think Brandon Nimmo is the main guy to fill this role. He's done it for years and I think he's going to continue to do it because he has just gotten better every single year. Obviously, there's one big sexy name which would cost all of the Twitter highlight merchants and that is Brian Reynolds. I mean, they, they would would think eventually they're going to move this guy. They're not regressing. St. Louis is going to move Tyler. They are going to move. They hate him. 
to an extent, but will provide you great defense, great base running. Yeah, he strikes out a ton. Yeah, this team needs some strikeouts. I'm okay with adding some strikeouts if it give me, you know, a guy 25, 30 homers. It's an option. Buy low. St. Louis always loves giving up talent, which is an organization I would buy from because they seem to just let talent get away before they become superstars. You can look at situations, maybe in the White Sox, you peep around what they do. I doubt Robert is available. Again, would cost you a shit ton. If they want to have an actual good caliber center fielder, it's going to come through the trade. If they want to go cheap and go the Kiermaier route, you can, but I hope not. And that gets us to the final bullet point on the checklist. Outfield depth. Khalil Lee, Nick Plummer, Jake Mangum. They're not MLB ready, and they're not MLB quality outfield options. There's some guys out there. AJ Pollock, Robbie Grossman was someone we talked about, Corey Dickerson, Chad Pinder, reunite him with his old buddy, Mark Canna. They were really good friends in Oakland. You could throw in Adam Duvall. You can throw in Andrew Whoa. McCutcheon. Throw in Will Myers, my boy, you know, good dude. A bunch of Mets legends, you know, Jake Marisnik is available. Marisnik, yeah. You know, there's a ton of Mets legends. So. You think it depends how you want to value it. Do you want to make the Nate Corner Priceman to have a righty killer, or do you want to get a lefty killer? And Grossman, Will Myers, guys like that who just hit left handed pitching. Because also, you do have Jeff McNeil kind of playing that fourth outfielder as well, but obviously, he's the starting second baseman. And, and you can even technically throw Brandon Drury into this equation as a bench bat, a guy that hits lefty and play outfield, not great, but he also can play a little bit of the infield as well. So he would give you more value than Tyler Naquin was giving you or than he has. It. And if somebody did get hurt, he could make starts. I've loved the Mets to do multiple major league ready outfielders, kind of like what they looked at with Kevin Pillar and Albert Almora, but actually give me good baseball players, you know? But it needs to be a deep depth chart for the outfielder. Because right now what you're looking at for the Mets outfield depth chart is Starling Marte, Mark Hanna, Khalil Lee. That's what you're looking at right now. So make it deeper than it is. Have replacements for those replacements. Nick Plummer is a free agent. So that's he's gone. Because then you have Jake Mangum, who has not played a single game in the majors. And then I think the next one after that is Alex Ramirez. That's pretty much it. Add quantity towards the back end. I just don't want to see a lack of depth. Hopefully we don't get disappointed. We usually do get disappointed, but there is a lot of work to do towards this offseason for this team to fix a lot of problems that they had this year. I just don't want to see something that's so similar to last year's team. I, I think we've talked about so much. You need to shake it up. You got to try some new things and just see what happens, you know, because it was clear that the philosophy they had, it was good. But it wasn't good enough. You got to go for it all. So if it means you take some risks, I mean, I think it's something they really have got to do this time around. They just have to finish the job. That's what I need them to do. If you just sign a bunch of former All-Stars, you build an All-Star team, you're going to have success. Look at the Dodgers. The Dodgers do that every year. They just sign a bunch of former All-Stars. It makes sense. Just sign a bunch of four-year, $40 million former dollar All-Stars. Brad Hand needs to come back. Definitely. Four-year deal, $97 million. I don't think I will be lasting four years, so I don't think we need to worry about that. Yeah.